Hi, my name is John Spence and I'm going to give you a little, little bit of my background. I was born and raised in Miami, a uh, wealthy family, but my father was an attorney. Got to go to some really cool schools, high school, uh, or, uh, prep school. And after I graduated from school, I wanted to stay close to home, so I went to the University of Miami where I failed out with a 1.6 GPA. Uh, so after that, I, uh, I, had, I came to Gainesville, Florida, where I live now and I applied at the University of Florida where they literally laughed at me and said, we don't take people like you. Uh, and then I transferred to Santa Fe Community College, uh, did well there, got my grades back, got into the University of Florida, and ended up graduating in the top three in the United States in my major. Uh, got hired out of co directly out of college to go work for the Rockefellers, and three years later I was named CEO of one of the Rockefeller Foundations. I had uh, projects in 20 countries around the world, did that for about six years, and then I went into very high-level strategic sales training, uh, helping companies close deals of $100 million or larger. And in 1994, uh, I went independent, and I've been a speaker, consultant, author, trainer uh, for the last 28 years. That happened fast, and that's, that's what brought me to today. And with that being said, as far as leadership, um, public speaking abilities, would you say that's more of a learned skill or as far as like from your vast studies or natural ability? Uh, it is definitely not a natural ability. I hated to read when I was growing up. Uh, the only reason I read books in high school is so that I could play on the football team. And I had to read uh, the summer assignments. And it wasn't until I, after I failed out of college that when I went back the second time, I realized that all the answers were in the books. And if I would just read the books, I would get better grades. Then when I got my first job, I realized that my salary, uh, when I read more books than everybody else, I got a bigger raise than everybody else. So I, I've always equated reading to the ability to um, go further in my life and my career. And the, the interesting thing is now all of the answers aren't in the books. And it's the knowledge that you gain, the information, it's called the adjacent new. You take your personal experience, things you've known from what you've lived, all the things you're reading or seeing on YouTube, the internet, blogs, whatever, you put those two together and it creates new baby ideas. And the new baby ideas are what allow you to stand out, be unique. Uh, and, and also there's a lot of skills you learn from books about leadership, uh, communications, conflict resolution. Those are all ideas and skills that you can read about, but then you have to go out and practice them and get better at them. Um, well, let's see, as far as, um, how'd you get onto the path as far as like, with um, leadership and as far as like, uh, skill developing, as far as like helping businesses? Because mm -hmm. um, I, I noticed that you were work with the Rockefeller Foundation, mm -hmm. and how did that help you as far as transition into leadership and helping other companies? Well, actually, I have an interesting story about how I started in leadership. When I was in high school, uh, I played football, that's why I read books during the summer, and I was a big guy about the size I am now, and I was always dead last on every lap and every sprint. Uh, always had an excuse for you know, pulling up the rear. And then my senior year, my uh, football coach came to me and said, I'm gonna make you the captain of the defensive team. I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. He said, one problem, you have to come in in the top five in all laps and in all sprints from now on. And the next day I went to practice and started coming in number three on all the laps and all the practice. So I realized that I had it in me all along. I just wasn't using it. And that was a huge epiphany. So that, that was my first entree into leadership is leading that football team and realizing I could have done it all along. In my business career, I was really thrust into the position of CEO. I was way too young, inexperienced, uh, really had no right running that company. But I got some great mentors, uh, a gentleman named Charlie Owen that was Mr. Rockefeller's right-hand man, who would put, a, and this is one of the ways I continue to read, is every Monday he would come to my office and give me a book, and he'd say, on Friday you're going to make a book report. And we would go to lunch together, and he would have me explain everything I read in the book. Then he would say, all right, what are three action steps you're going to take from the things you just learned in this book? And I would tell him the action steps, he'd write it down, and he'd say, okay, now you're going to be held accountable for this in your job. Here's another book. So for six years, every Monday I got a book, every Friday I had a book report, and then the next Monday I was held accountable for actually implementing the things that I was learning, which is the big difference. A lot of people read books, but with him forcing me to take action on what I was learning uh, really changed everything. And then the last thing that got me into leadership was the idea that I don't mind stress. Uh, when things are difficult or challenging, uh, I'm happy to step up and handle that pressure to help other people. 
So if, if, I, if I think I have the answer or I can find someone that has the answer or I can figure it out on my own, uh, I'm happy to be the one that, that steps up front and says, I'll, I'll take responsibility and accountability for this. And that pressures me to deliver it because I care about other people and I want them to be successful too. Awesome. And with <clears throat> running a company that as large as the uh, Rockefeller Foundation, uh, you literally came out with a book saying that it's all awesomely simple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how did you uh, come to those principles as far as um, taking something as stressful as running a multi, uh, well, international business and breaking it down and saying, well, it's actually simple? Well, a, a couple reasons. It's uh, business at its, at its heart is not really very complex. You can make it complex. And one of the reasons I did that is when I was young and running the company, I only knew the fundamentals. I didn't understand complexity. I couldn't do high-level strategic planning. I could barely read a balance sheet. So I had to make it as simple as possible just for me <laughs> to be able to get through it. Then as I started to work in other companies and, and continue to read and learn, uh, a pattern emerged. Uh, you know, Some people ask me, why do you read 100 books a year? Does it get redundant? Yes, it gets very redundant, which is excellent because if I read 30 or 50 books on leadership and they all say basically the same things, and these are some of the top leadership thinkers in the world, then I'm guessing the six or seven things that show up in all those books are probably the pattern of what a great leader does. So I have studied business now for 30 years and there's a very clear pattern of fundamental things that every organization needs to do to, to create a successful company. And those are pretty straightforward. Talent, you gotta have the very best people you can possibly get on your team. Uh, then it's culture, you gotta have a winning culture of people that love what they do, they're highly engaged, they wanna do great work. Then you have to have extreme customer focus. The customer pays all the bills, so I need to understand them deeply and deliver value to them. And then all of that is multiplied by disciplined execution. Very much like what my mentor said, is the ideas are nice, but you gotta be able to execute them. Lots of businesses have wonderful people, great culture, nice ideas, but unless you can execute consistently in the marketplace, you can't build a successful company. So there's four fundamental things that every business needs to do to create and sustain success. As far as the uh, last question, what that leads me into as far as uh, executing and having vision. Um, as far as like a, a young entrepreneur starting to build a company or looking to expand, um, what would uh, your advice be as far as for executing his vision and including other people in and getting them to align? Well, uh, I get to coach a lot of entrepreneurs. I, I serve as executive in residence at a couple of universities. And I'll give you a couple ideas around this. Um, the first one is when you're building a company, and Jim Collins, who's a very, very famous man, uh, leadership and management thinker, came up with the idea of the three circles. And circle number one is what are you passionate about? What do you love? What keeps you up at night? You know, what makes you jump out of bed and run to in the morning that you're so excited to do it? So passion. Circle number two is that you're really good at too. You can be passionate about something that you're not good at. Uh, so you've got to have passion and skills. Those two go. And then the third one, the last circle, so we got circle one, circle two, circle three, where, uh, where overlap is success. The bottom one is it has a strong economic driver that people in the marketplace want to pay for it. And I meet a lot of entrepreneurs that have the first two. They're passionate about something they're really good at, but unfortunately no one wants to pay for it. And you can't build a business on that. So how do you bring that vision? You've, you've got to have a real clear idea of the value you're bringing to the marketplace. And the, there's clear phraseology on this. You have to have a vivid, compelling, and well-communicated vision and strategy for growth. So that's how you attract talent to your team, by this exciting, compelling vision of what you want to build and a clear strategy, a game plan to get there so they have confidence that you can actually achieve it. Uh, the other thing for entrepreneurs, and I've, I've owned or been the CEO of eight companies in my entire career, is it's hard. It's really hard. You're, there's going to be nights you're up late, uh, weekends you're up early, working weekends. And once you start to run companies, you realize it's not just you, that you're responsible for all the people that work there. Uh, I don't have kids, but when I used to run large companies, I worried about all the people I had to put through college. Uh, because I knew that their family was depending on me to run the organization well so they could pay their mortgage, they could send their kids to school. Uh, and that's a lot of stress, and not everybody can handle that level of stress. Uh, as far as like within this uh, social media age, as far as um, young entrepreneurs like via Instagram, social media, are looking to um, build their personal brand and um, branch out, what would be some advice you would have as far as building a personal brand or say, um, but not specifically around a, com uh, a company? 
Okay, uh, actually building a, a brand or a strategy uh, for a successful company and your own personal brand is very similar. And you're going to hear some phraseology over and over again in these uh, interviews. Is first thing you do is you got to, you've got to bring something really unique and exciting and compelling in your personal brand. What do you do that's that's interesting that other people aren't doing it? You do it in a way that other people uh, haven't thought of doing it. So it's got to be unique and compelling, whatever your brand is. Uh, number two, it's got to be highly valued in the marketplace. You can have a great brand, but if nobody sees it as a brand to invest in, and that's internally in your company. If you work for somebody else, you've got a personal brand inside of that company. If you're an entrepreneur, you've got a personal brand as well as your company. And oftentimes, your brand becomes the company's brand, uh, you or you become the company's brand. You're the face of the company. So it's got to be unique and compelling. It's got to be something that's, that people are willing to pay for. Uh, the third one, it's got to be difficult, if not impossible, to copy. Difficult, if not impossible, to copy. I'll use myself as an example. I've been reading 100 and 120 business books a year for 30 years. You could read three or 4,000 books to catch up with me, but it would be difficult. Not impossible, but very difficult. Uh, and then when I look at my background, Rockefeller, this, that, and the other, a couple of awards, blah, blah, blah. Again, almost impossible to copy. So my personal brand, uh, by the way, my personal brand is making the very complex awesomely simple. Uh, worldwide, that's what people know me for, is I take complex ideas and make them very simple. And then the last step is you've got to be able to deliver it. So you've got to be able to do what you say you do. So it's got to be unique and compelling. People want to pay for it. Uh, it's difficult, if not impossible, to copy. And you can actually deliver the brand promise. Company built that way, personal strategy and personal brand built that way. And if you can meet those four criteria, you have built a very powerful personal brand. Okay, uh, so how do you feel that um, leadership has changed since the, uh, what were the previous 30 years that you've uh, been involved with the business? Yeah, I, um, I entered uh, the workforce in 1989, and when my boss said jump, it was how high, sir. It was all command and control, do as I say, not as I do. They call it theory X leadership. Basically, it's militaristic. Uh, people just tell you what to do. Then, uh, several years later, it swung to leadership by spreadsheet, by numbers. And that's when the boss would come out and say, we need to reduce headcount, which means go fire a bunch of people. Uh, and it was just, everything was numbers and spreadsheets, not people and information. Uh, then now it's swung back to the middle in what's called servant leadership. And servant leadership flips the normal leadership pyramid of the leader at the top and all the people at the bottom on its head, where it's all the people at the top and the leader at the bottom serving them. And basically, in this way, it's not the leader telling you what to do, it's the leader saying, what can I do for you? Uh, and there's three key skills I believe that it's, it, you need to be successful as a servant leader going forward. Uh, the first one's IQ, competence, you gotta be good at what you do. Uh, and you can, you can increase your IQ. Many people said can't, you can. It can also decrease, so <laughs> go either way. Um, the next one is EQ, that's your emotional question. And that's your ability to make a genuine connection with other people. It's sort of like self-awareness and empathy put together. Another word I use there is concern. And then the last one, which is brand new, is AQ, which is your adaptability question. Uh, in, the, in the sort of world we live in now that's fast changing, technology, things are going a zillion miles an hour, the leader of the future is going to need to be adaptable, agile, move quick, uh, discard old ideas, pick up new ideas, and not just like embrace change or revel in change, but drive change, be, as I said, be a change ninja. So those are the things that I see that are going to be necessary as leadership continues to, to change as we move forward. Um, as far as um, developing because I noticed that you speak really well, and um, it's uh, even uh, now I haven't seen you like stumble over words or anything. As far as developing um, the skill set, as far as for public speaking, mm -hmm. is there were there like activities you've done, or was that something you've studied as far as via reading? Like, how did you develop your public speaking ability? Uh, well, first of all, I've been doing uh, public speaking now for as a profession for about 28 years. Largest audience I've ever talked to was 18,000 people. Uh, but I gave a talk the other night for 12 people and I was just as nervous and scared giving a talk for 12 people as I am for 12,000. So it, it, as long as you are still nervous, you still care. <laughs> I think the minute you ah, whatever is probably the minute you should stop doing that. Uh, when I was younger, I did get sent to the Dale Carnegie training course by my dad uh, to help me understand how to interact with people a little bit more and there was a lot of public speaking in that. And then 
when I started in this business, I'd been in it for a little while, I went to a thing called Toastmasters, which is local groups in cities around the country where you come every week and everybody gives a little speech and it's all structured. But the, the main way I've learned is to watch other great speakers, to watch video, to listen to them. Uh, the, the reading helps with vocabulary, but the truth of the matter is, as a speaker, you should have a very uh, easy to understand vocabulary. Big words do not impress people, they confuse them. And I was mentoring a young lady this morning, and I pointed out to her that she said like at the beginning and end of every sentence. And it was like getting like really like annoying, and she, she couldn't like stop, and I was all like about to like kill her. Uh, one of the reasons that I'm a better speaker now is I've learned that when I don't have something to say, it's fine to just pause. I don't have to fill it with, uh, and I, I don't know if you've seen it, I've said um several times at the beginning of this, but because I keep going at a fairly rapid pace, and I don't say it at the beginning and ending of every sentence, you don't hear the ums as much. So, and it's just a lot of practice. I mean, I, I give 70 to 80 major speeches a year all over the world, and I have for a long time. So I've had a lot of practice, and I've messed up. I've fallen down on stage, I've fallen off the stage. <laughs> so even with a ton of practice, you can still make some pretty big mistakes. But as long as you get up and continue to speak with confidence, things typically turn out okay. I do not want to mess up their audio there. No, it's okay. I don't, I don't know if I can edit me laughing. No, no, no. Well, I mean, you're here. <laughs> laughing is fine in the background. No. No, I've walked right off the front of the stage twice, two or three times. One time, a really high stage over an orchestra pit, and luckily they had a big net, because if not, I would have fallen like a, like 30 feet into oh, the wow. orchestra pit and, and died. But there was a giant net, and I, bam, and I landed in the net, and like, ch -ch -ch -ch, crawled back out. Hey, everybody, that'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> oh yeah, I've made some big mistakes. Trust me. Okay, I probably would like if, if the fall didn't kill me. I'd probably die from embarrassment. So. <laughs> yeah, I got booed off the stage in my very first speech. Oh wow! wow. Yeah, they well, asked me the question. Oh yeah. <laughs> See, the good stuff comes out of this casual conversation. You want me to just you know, start explaining it now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, a funny story. Now that I've been doing professional speaking for almost 30 years, I got booed off the stage badly at my very first speech. Uh, I had just graduated from college, gone to work for the Rockefellers, and the CEO uh, was supposed to give a speech at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, which is the world's premier uh, ocean science center. And he didn't want to go give it. So he gave me the speech and said, study this and go give this speech at Woods Hole. And I get up, I'm, I'm 23 years old, 22, all the most eminent scientists in the world sitting there for the marine research. And I'm supposed to thank several of them. And I start thanking them, and I have no idea how to pronounce their names. So I'm like, Bob Frucklenflocken, and, and, and Sue Schmoopenblop, or whatever. And I'm totally, just totally messing up their names. And I'm about halfway through the speech, and they turn the microphone off. And I'm like, tap, tap, tap on the microphone. I go, there must be some problem. The microphone went out here, and they went, no problem. You're done. <laughs> and they booed me off the stage, literally booed me off the stage. But that night they took me out to dinner and uh, said, whoever made you do that, go home and kill them. Because you were unprepared. That wasn't fair to you. We could tell you tried. And it isn't your fault. This just, it, you're not ready to do this yet. So don't worry about it. You'll be fine. But whoever made you do this really put you in a bad position and they were the one that made you fail. And uh, I, I'll always remember the fact that, and, you know, because I, I mess up in speeches now too, uh, no one's going to die. It's not brain surgery, I'm talking. So <laughs> I mess something up, I say the wrong thing, whatever. A, most people don't catch it. They just don't realize, because in my head I know what I was supposed to say, but if I say something different, nobody in the audience knows that. And then B, if you just bomb, that's okay, you get up tomorrow and try again. You apologize to the audience. I had to do this two years ago. I had a brand new speech I'd never given before, and it was not good. It just didn't work out. And I had another talk the same the next day to the same group, and I came and apologized. I said, yesterday I wasted an hour of your lives. I'm very sorry. Uh, I, it was a brand new talk. I was practicing it or trying it out on you guys. didn't work. I promised to be better today. And they actually said the apology was the most powerful thing out of everything I was teaching <laughs> because of the vulnerability to stand up in front of 400 CEOs and say, I'm really, really sorry I didn't do a good job. Oh, wow. That's honesty. <laughs> Hey man, I'm still alive. Nobody died. <laughs> <laughs> They're all my friends now, so <laughs> it worked out. Yeah, it worked out fine. Okay, and uh, I noticed that um, 
during our conversation today, you've mentioned uh, mentorship several yes. times. Um, how important is uh, mentorship as far as for development and um, uh, furthering your career? Mentorship is absolutely fundamental. Uh, it's one. There's two ideas about growth outside of school and other things. Finding a good mentor uh, that has expertise in the area you want to learn. So it isn't just someone older than you or somebody that you know, runs a big company. They actually have to have the knowledge and information ideas that you specifically want to learn. Uh, then number two with that part of it is you can never waste their time. There's two or three things. Uh, come prepared, have questions, know what you want to learn, tell them that, respect their time. And if they give you an assignment or advice, uh, take it and try it and then come back and report on it. Much like I said, char the, my mentor would give me a book, make, I had to make a book report, and then he would test to see if I was implementing what I was learning. That shows respect for your mentor. Another thing you do with your mentor is you want to give back to them. So find an area they're interested in, something they want to learn about. Uh, for me, it might be blockchain or uh, cryptocurrency or something like that I know nothing about. But the young, I was mentoring a young lady this morning. She knows a lot about that, so she was teaching me. She's 19, and I'm furiously taking notes, trying to learn about cryptocurrency and, and blockchain. I also make another point there. If you're going to go to your mentor, bring a notepad, take notes, take it seriously. Now let's take it up from the mentor idea to one that's, that's even more powerful. Uh, one of the reasons I failed out of college on the first try is I didn't ask anybody for help. I thought I could do it all by myself, uh, showed up at class and failed. When I transferred to the community college, Santa Fe, where I went, and then on to the University of Florida, first thing I did was start study groups in all my classes. And I would walk up to the front of the room on the first day and say, hey, I'm John, I'm going to start a study group. Uh, anybody wants to be in the study group, you're welcome. It's Tuesday and Thursday nights. And love to have you in the study group as long as you have a 3.6 GPA or higher. Uh, now, never, nobody ever asked me my GPA because I started the damn group. Uh, but the idea there was is I surrounded myself with really smart people. And, you know, I had, it started big. And by the time I went to graduate, I had a study group of about six or six of us. College became really easy. I only had to do a fifth of the work. You know, it was like, you read chapters one through five, you read six through 10, you go visit the TA, I'll go get the notes from somebody that took the class last year. We divided it up and we all, my last two years in college, set the curve in almost every class we were in. Fast forward to today, I'm uh, 54, I'll be 55 next month. I still have a study group. It's called a mastermind group. And the mastermind group is when you get some people in your community that are bright, sharp, smart, talented, high values, high integrity, and you get together, we get together about once every 45 days, we assign books, we assign homework, uh, and you come in and we push each other, we help each other. And if someone has a problem in their business, all the rest of us, there's about 18 of us, uh, get in and we help and we, we call people and we make things happen. So that mastermind group is something you can use for the rest of your life. When I graduated from college and got the first one, I started a mastermind group of CEOs under the age of 30. Then when I turned 31, it was under the age of 40, and now we just took the, the age thing out of it, and it's just a CEO group. So unbelievably powerful idea. Uh, so as far as um, mentorship and it being crucial, how would you, um, you suggest as far as going about choosing a mentor? Does the mentor choose the mentee, or is it vice versa? How does you have like a meeting of a mind to develop that relationship? Great question. Very, At least in my experience, very rarely does the mentor pick the mentee. Uh, every now and then someone will say, hey, you're really cool, smart, bright, you know, let's have breakfast together, lunch together, coffee together every now and then. But most of the time it's the mentee that seeks out the mentor. I mentioned earlier you want to find somebody who has the skills, abilities uh, that you're trying to learn, the knowledge, experience you're trying to learn from, respect their time, treat them great, and then put a, put a time frame on it, six months. And at six months, if you're still learning, ask them, can we go another six months? But when you've got to a point where you really feel like you've learned about as much as you can from that person, you say, I, I think I've got the main things that I asked you to teach me. I feel pretty good about it. Who are someone else you can introduce me to that you think might be able to help me? Or I'm really interested now in learning more about uh, human resources or marketing. Uh, do you know anyone in, in town that you think would be a great mentor for me in marketing? And every time you do that, you not only do you increase your network, but you get a, a direct introduction, referral from your mentor to one of their peers. Rarely does that person say no because their friend asked them to mentor you. So that's how you continue to get new mentors going forward. Um, as far as for uh, developing the like, as far as like content or um, your speech and preparation, um, how do you? What are, what are your steps as far as for delivering and? 
can we go with the useful information to deliver to your audience? Uh, there's a that, there's a multiple level to this to this question as many of the other ones. Uh, in the early part of my career, I used other people's information. So I'd read and study and say, oh, according to Kuzis and Posner in their great book, Leadership Challenge, here's the four things you do as a great leader. And then I would list their stuff. And about eight or 10 years ago, this is after, you know, 20 something years doing this, I had a client, the one the client that I had to speak in front of, uh, actually, this was 22,000 people. They said, you can't use anybody else's information. Everything has to be from you. Everything has to be unique. And that was a huge turning point in my career because now I had to have an opinion. Up until then, it was me sharing other people's ideas and other people's data. So the way I do it now is I'll study and read and look, uh, and I customize every single speech. Every time I give a speech, I look at the audience, what they're focused on, who they are, what industry they're in, and I change the speech to match their, their, uh, their needs. So every single speech is one of a kind. It's built from elements I had before. So I, I'll read, study, look, I'll look at the industry, what the client wants, what outcome they want, and then I will start to piece together a story in my head. And, I, and I'm very visual, so I do it by starting with slide decks. And I'll move a slide here, add a new slide, move a slide from another thing until I start to see the framework of the story coming. And every speech has a, a general pattern. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. I tell you, then I tell you what I told you. That's basically the path it goes. So I just do that with slides. And it's, uh, it's, it's really one of the funnest parts of my job. I love the creativity of building slide decks and stories in anticipation of being able to deliver really valuable information to the audience. So that's, that's my methodology for going about creating a speech. So this is um, one of the questions we got via Facebook. Um, I think discipline is important for obtaining success. How do you increase discipline in the beginning and maintain it throughout your career? Uh, I'm not going to agree with that. <laughs> I don't think it's discipline that you discipline yourself to do something you don't want to do. You for, if you love what you're doing, you don't need any discipline. Uh, to, for me, discipline comes in when you're when you're when you're making yourself do something you don't want to do or that you don't enjoy. There, I, I, almost everybody I know that is very successful does it because they love doing what they're doing. They get up early, they stay up late, they work hard, they put in extra hours, they read, they study, they learn, they're curious. Not because they're disciplined, but because they've made it their life. It's their craft, it's their profession. The outside things like uh, going to the gym, diet, blah, 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 that takes discipline. Uh, I know I've, I've lost almost 100 pounds, and for the first year or two, it was, took massive discipline. Now it's just a lifestyle, it's changed. Still got some weight to lose, but we're in the right direction. Uh, but for the most part, around business, there's no such thing. You don't need discipline. You just need passion for something that people want to buy. Um, as far as um, you've been uh, doing entrepreneurship, um, business, speaking for over 30 years, what are some of the um, keys you would say as far as having longevity? Because you know, with business, you know, I believe um, the majority of them fail within the first five years. Um, how do you overcome the cycles and uh, push forward as far as having a long career, still remaining relevant, the, keeping the passion alive, like you were saying. What are some of my tips for that? It, to me, it's different between business and personal. Business is all about delivering value to the marketplace. As long as you continue to wow, delight, and excite your customers, and you stay close to them, and you give them something they want to pay for, you can continue to, ma to maintain a successful business as long as some management or leadership issue doesn't destroy it. From a personal standpoint, I think it's maintaining curiosity. Uh, you asked in the question, I've been doing this almost 30 years. I realize now that I'm, I'm probably uh, the worst I've ever, not the worst, but I realize how little I know. The, as I, the more I've done this, the more I realize that I, there's so much more I could learn, so much things I could do to get better, that I really feel like I'm sort of at the bottom of my career building it all the time instead of at the top of my career. So I think maintaining that idea of there's so much more and, and not so much more is like more awards, more money. There's just so much more learning and so much more opportunity to help people. And the more I learn, the more I realize how much more I have to learn. Yeah, I wish to be a uh, motivational speaker. I have worked in management for a little over 10 years, have a uh, Bachelor of Science degrees. But I was looking as far as to building up my brand to become attractive enough to speak at colleges and Fortune 500 companies. What is your advice to would be for me to become attractive enough to 
um, present in front of audiences. Okay, so the, I heard in the question I want to become a motivational speaker. There are different types of speakers. Uh, I am not a motivational speaker. Uh, people do get excited at my talks. That's not my goal. Uh, I am an informational speaker. I deliver value and content. You Speakers do, some are persuasive, some entertain, uh, some motivate. So if you want to become a great motivational speaker, you have to have an amazing story. Uh, you got to have something you've done that people in the audience will go, wow, uh, or have knowledge or information that people will get very excited about, motivated about. So the big thing is, is do you have some unique, compelling, exciting, personal story? Uh, you know, I climbed Mount Everest backwards, you know, something like that. You know, I, I, you know, I, I died in a crash, but I'm here to tell you about it anyways. Uh, something like that that people go, that's amazing. And if you don't have that, or it isn't something that willing to pick, people aren't willing to pay for, I meet a lot of motivational speakers that have a real strong passion about something that happened in their life. Unfortunately, nobody else really cares. It's not that compelling. Uh, and I feel bad for them. You know, I want to tell my story. Well, nobody really wants to hear it, or at least pay for it. <laughs> you, you can go down and get it for free, but no one's going to pay you five, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars to tell your story because it's not very exciting. The other side of the coin, though, is that as an informational speaker, and you've got to have expertise. One is an exciting, unique story, or a, a someone else's, or other stories you can tell to get people motivated. The other side of being a speaker is you've got to be what's called a thought leader. I hate that phrase, uh, but someone that has unique information, ideas, research, data that that will help the people in the audience perform better, make more money, run their company better, whatever it might be. And there's a big difference between those two types of speakers. Okay. I was say, what would be your um, your fundamentals as far as for a um, running a corporation and um, keeping your uh, staff inspired? Um, it's interesting you ask staff inspired because when you look at the folks entering in the workforce now, millennials and, and soon Gen Z, they have a different motivation than people my age. Uh, I'm a boomer and, and an extra, the same ones. We were, we were interested in having a good career, climbing the career ladder, staying in a company, retiring there, getting a promotion, getting a big title. When you look at the folks that, that are coming into the workforce now, they want to work for an organization that has a strong purpose. They want to know that they're making a difference in the world, that their companies, you know, like putting a dent in the universe. Actually, younger folks today, well, if they work for a company with really strong purpose, they actually will reduce the amount of money they need to get. They, they, purpose is more important than pay. Another big thing that you have to, so you have to help people understand the purpose of your company, and that will get them engaged and excited. So, so what do you do that if you shut down the company tomorrow, people would wake up the next day and go, oh my, where'd they go? I love that place. I love that company. They helped me so much. What is it about your company that does that? Sometimes what the company does is not particularly exciting. So what you do then is your company gets excited and in, involved in some exciting uh, charity. We, we are the biggest group that goes to the breast cancer walk every year. We, we work hard and we donate extra money and we volunteer at the children's hospital. So the company's not that exciting, but how we interact in the community and how we give back. Purpose is real big. The, the um, values of the corporation are also big. Many younger uh, people coming to the marketplace today say, I want to work for a company where my personal core values align very strongly with the core values of the company. So I, I feel like I go to work every day and I'm living my values. And the last thing is just have a great culture, which is, I just say, just a great culture. A winning culture is one of the main things that attracts top talent. And a winning culture is things like it's a fun place to work. I work with my friends, oftentimes my best friend, has a family atmosphere. Uh, I'm doing important, meaningful work. I take pride in the organization I work for. I get lots of praise and appreciation. When you build a culture like that, that keeps your employees uh, motivated and engaged as well. Um, were you a good um, note taker in school? Yes. Was, was I a good note taker in school? Yes. Um, I'm a visual learner, mm -hmm. and so I have to see stuff to remember it. Uh, years ago, I took a thing called the captain's exam to, become a, to get my license as a boat captain. Mm -hmm. uh, so that I could run, you know, larger boats and ships and things like that. And it was a thousand question test, a thousand. And the way I learned it, I was taught to draw pictures and then it, as I was learning the information and then put information around the picture. So it was a diamond or a delta and I would put all the stuff about how to operate a ship on the Mississippi Delta on that picture. Mm -hmm. 
then when I they taught us before we take the test to take out our notes before we ever look at the test, draw all the pictures we can remember that you know the squares, the diamonds, the deltas, fill them all in, then turn it over, then open the test. And that way you don't get confused by a question, you already have the answer written down. So I'm a furious note taker, I am with my books, I journal. But for me especially, I have to have stuff written down because I can't remember it otherwise. I actually have a semi-photographic memory, and if, I'm, if I write it down or look at it or get the picture, if I'm trying to answer something, I can close my eyes and actually read the page in my mind from a book and then talk about it. So I'm very, very lucky to have that innate ability. Because mm, I'm, I'm a visual learner too, as mm -hmm. well. But if I'm just like, sometimes it's hard. And while well, I'm just taking like literature classes, mm -hmm. it's hard to take notes. I agree. It be it be going so fast. I was like, okay, this is just this is just scrap or scrap. And with them ask me, oh, can I see you notes? I was like, you don't want to read my notes. <laughs> yeah, I go to a lot of conferences, and whenever I go to speak someplace, I will go listen to the other speakers mm -hmm. to learn from them. And I have a couple of rules. Mm -hmm. If I get 50 pages into a book and I haven't underlined anything, I stop reading it. Just put it down, do donate it, give it away. Because if out of a 200-page book, if the author can't teach me something or give me something interesting in the first quarter of the book, I'm not going to waste my time reading the last 150 pages of the book. Mm -hmm. I'm the same way when I go see a speech uh, or a conference. If I haven't, if in the first 15, 15 minutes I haven't taken at least a half a page of notes, I close my book and I leave and go read a good book or do something else that's valuable. But I'm very, very disciplined at this of not wasting time. Uh, uh, on speeches or books or blogs or audiobooks or podcasts mm -hmm. that out of the gate doesn't deliver something that's new and exciting and interesting and will help me learn. Mm -hmm. For someone who wants to be, uh, who wants to get into the business, will, mm -hmm. you, will you suggest um, or do you encourage um, someone who's young going to college for mm -hmm. that to in, into pursuing that or self-taught is the best way to go? Uh, this is a really good question. I get this question a lot about, you know, do I need to get my MBA? Mm -hmm. And my answer is always this. If the job you want requires you to have a degree or like an MBA and you can't get that job without an MBA, then you have to go to school for an MBA or you have to go to school. Uh, or another reason to stay in school or to get an advanced degree is you work, you get to study under someone who's very famous. So you get to become a protege of someone that's extremely famous in your industry. Uh, that way you have that connection and connection to their network. Or the third one is the alumni. Uh, if you go to a very prestigious school, uh, they have an amazing alumni network. That alumni network can help you for the rest of your life. Uh, I, I was mentioning earlier, uh, chatting, uh, that I have a degree in public relations, mm -hmm. uh, which is not particularly helpful for business. I never took a business class in college, not one. Mm -hmm. uh, everything I've learned about business has been either self-taught through reading or experience or through mentors and other people that have helped me. So if you don't need a college degree or the information you get in college isn't going to dramatically help you with your career, I'm a big fan for go out and just start doing it. You know, just get a job in that industry or try to work for that person and then be a voracious learner. I spend more time now studying than, than ever, ever, ever I did in, in college. And my study, and you have to continue to study for the rest of your life. It isn't like get out of college and stop. It's get out of college and start. <laughs> and it's got to be more and more and more because you're the only one that drives your own learning. So you've got to be a lifelong learner. Um, and once you understand that all that information is what will help create that foundation of success, you get greedy, not for money, but greedy for learning because the learning will allow you to build a great career. For someone like me, I want to own my own business. And uh, I'm not I'm not a huge fan of going to work for somebody. Mm -hmm. I'm eager to learn what can I uh, what can I build for myself and mm -hmm. build like a brand for myself and um, for my the company that I want to pursue. And also in real estate, um, you don't necessarily need a uh, degree for that. You can take a real estate mm -hmm. math, uh, class. Um, for someone who's pursuing that mm -hmm. will you um, encourage to like be in school because one of the reasons why I wanted to be in school was um, you know in my childhood mm -hmm. uh, usually people say you're not going to be in school you're not going you know you can't go to school yeah. you're not smart enough so I wanted to prove them wrong and go to school and so I had to I literally stopped my online business I want I stopped everything because I wanted to prove to everybody that I can mm -hmm. I am smart enough to go to school but now it's kind of like okay this is a waste of time because it's not helping me. <laughs> uh, 
here's what I will tell you. There's a couple of things you learn in, in school other than whatever the topic is. You learn critical thinking. Uh, you learn how to learn. Really, all to me, all college, university is learning how to learn better. Mm -hmm. So you're picking up new skills around studying, reading, writing, things like that, better spoken communication. I think school's great, but if you can be successful in a career and there isn't anything really in a college that they can teach you to be better at that, uh, I know that you're interested in jewelry. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they have a lot of classes on how to build and sell jewelry. Mm -hmm. So in that particular industry, going and I, I think though if you don't go to school, you need to have a good mentor. Mm -hmm. You need to have someone in the industry who's teaching you and helping you, takes her under their wing. Uh, in the real estate industry, find somebody who's been doing it for 20 years and get them to teach you, share ideas, help you grow. And the good ones will do that. You're, you have to push yourself just as hard to learn on your own as you would in school. but you don't need a degree to be successful. Uh, I love school and I, I stayed in it and I think it's great, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of people that are very, very successful without finishing their college degree, and there's a lot that are very successful with their college degree. When you were getting, um, when you were getting to the business, if there was some people that inspire you or the people that you was um, eager to learn, um, eager to learn from? Yeah, there, there were some people in my industry that I was eager, uh, eager to learn from. There were people that I really admired in the business world, a gentleman named Tom Peters. I really thought Seth Godin wrote some good stuff. I give you some names, which I've, uh, since they've all become friends, which is really cool. Uh, I, the thing that really drove me was I have a very high level of self competitiveness. Mm -hmm. So I was always not trying to prove anybody else wrong, but prove to myself that I could do better. Mm -hmm. And that was a big part of my inspiration was I, I know I can do better than this. I know I can, and again, it's very important that I, I think I outline this is my definition, most people's definition in America of success is money, fame, and power. Mm -hmm. That's nice, but that I, I know from being around people like that, that isn't really success. To me, my definition of success is when your self-concept and core values are in harmony with your daily actions and behaviors. In other words, you thought deeply about who you really want to be, what you want to achieve, what's important to you, and you've got very clear values and you live those every day. If you become rich, famous, and powerful, great, if that's really what you want. But if you never achieve that, but you put your head on your pillow every night and go, another awesome day, I'm so proud of the work I did, I really strove for excellence today and did a great job, to me, that is someone who's very highly successful.